Hello and welcome to the fourth video of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA. This video will focus on section 4, providing information. As a brief overview, this section of the PSA assesses the ability to provide important information about medications and treatments to patients or healthcare professionals. These questions consist of a case presentation and a new management plan. You will then be expected to select the most important piece of information relating to this new management plan, which must be provided to the patient or healthcare professional. This information may relate to ensuring that the patient can make an informed choice and consent when starting a new management plan. Alternatively, the information could be related to the important safety aspects of medications or treatments. Lastly, the information may relate to providing other healthcare professionals important information about a new treatment plan. Within the PSA, this section is worth 12 marks. There are six providing information questions within the PSA, each worth two marks. In each question, you will select one out of five options. The four other options are distractor answers. Core content typically assessed in this section that might be the focus of the question include insulin, warfarin, a salbutamol inhaler, methotrexate, or an oral hypoglycemic. All of these are commonly prescribed and are within the remit of a foundation year doctor. Here we have our first question. A 30 year old man presents to a GP complaining of ongoing low mood, insomnia, weight loss, and fatigue for over two weeks. No significant past medical history. He normally takes gentamicin eardrops. The patient does not smoke, drink alcohol, or use illicit drugs. His mental state exam demonstrates poor eye contact, slow speech, and a blunt affect with low mood, no delusions, and insight is intact. His investigations show a normal haemoglobin, white cell count, and platelets. Urea and electrolytes are within the normal range as well. His ECG shows no abnormal findings. He is now advised to take sertraline 50 milligrams orally daily for six weeks. The question asks you to select the most appropriate option that should be communicated to the patient. Time to pause here and consider your answer. Now that you've considered your answer, let's go through the question. The question is asking you to establish what is the most important information to explain to a patient with depression but still has good insight. The question informs you that he will be offered sertraline for six weeks. Sertraline is one of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, otherwise called SSRIs, which is one of the major classes of antidepressant drugs. The clinical presentation is typical of a patient with depression, and there are no other influences such as alcohol or drugs involved. The question therefore focuses on giving important information about the drug sertraline. The correct answer is D. This option describes some of the major side effects of sertraline. GI disturbance and bleeding. SSRIs inhibit the serotonin transporter, which is responsible for the uptake of serotonin into the platelets. SSRIs can therefore deplete platelet serotonin, leading to a reduced ability to form clots and raises the risk of bleeding. This is very dangerous and patients should be made aware of this so that they can inform their doctors if they notice any blood in feces or if they vomit blood. They should also go to A&E if bleeding doesn't stop, for example, from cuts or nosebleeds. Answer A is true, as SSRIs may also impair performance of skilled tasks, for example, driving or operating heavy machinery. So patients should be counselled about these effects, although this should be after informing the patient of the major side effects. Answer B is also a true fact, since common side effects of SSRIs are sleep disturbances. Hence, Taking sertraline will not help his insomnia. However, this information is less important. In the same topic as sleep disturbances, answer C is also true, as this can be suggested to patients who have trouble sleeping to help potentially reduce the side effects of sertraline. However, this information is less important. Answer E is also true, and a rather hard distractor. 
St. John's wort is a herbal remedy which helps with depression. And both St. John's wort and sertraline can both increase the risk of serotonin syndrome. Hence, they should not be taken together. This information is perhaps the second most important piece of information here, following the answer, D. I hope this made sense and shows why telling patients about the serious side effect of sertraline is the most appropriate answer to this question. Now on to our second question. Here we have a 37 year old man presenting to his GP for smoking cessation advice. He has a recent diagnosis of COPD and has a history of type 1 diabetes mellitus. He takes salbutamol and insulin. He has been smoking for 10 years and smokes 20 cigarettes per day, which equates to 10 pack years. All the examination findings are normal. Investigations reveal a raised HbA1c. His ECG shows a sinus rhythm and his chest x-ray shows lung hyperinflation. He has been advised to commence nicotine replacement therapy using sublingual tablets. Two tablets every hour continued for three months. The question proceeds to ask you to select the most appropriate option that should be communicated to the patient. Now would be a good time to pause the video to come up with your own answer. Hopefully you now have an answer. So let's see how you got on. This question is asking you to establish what is the most important information to explain to a patient with diagnosed COPD who wants to stop smoking. The question informs you that the patient should commence nicotine replacement therapy using sublingual tablets. Nicotine replacement therapy is effective to aid smoking cessation and comes in many forms, including dermal patches and sublingual tablets. Important aspects of this question are that the patient has a history of type 1 diabetes and is on insulin. So let's take a look at the answers. The correct answer is D. As mentioned before, the patient has type 1 diabetes mellitus and needs insulin injections. Nicotine can have an effect on carbohydrate metabolism and patients may require less insulin as a result of stopping smoking. Patients may also need to reduce the amount of nicotine replacement depending on the blood sugar. It is therefore recommended that patients should have their blood sugar monitored closely, especially if they have diabetes, to prevent diabetic complications such as hypoglycemia. Hence, this is the most important information to give here. Answer A, while true, is not very useful information, as the patient probably already knows this and may only provide additional motivation for him to stop smoking. Answer B is true, as patients often experience withdrawal symptoms caused by nicotine dependence, which may be similar to the side effects of nicotine replacement therapy. This can be useful for patients, but not the most important information here. Answer C lists some common side effects of nicotine replacement therapy. However, none are severe. Hence, patients should be made aware of them if possible, but this is not the most important information here. Answer E is worth mentioning to patients when teaching the patient how to correctly use sublingual tablets. Sublingual nicotine tablets should not be chewed or swallowed to prevent additional side effects. However, this information is not important as the answer choice D. I hope this explanation has been clear and demonstrates the importance of identifying the most appropriate information that should be communicated to the patient. Now on to our third and final question. A 24 year old man presents to the psychiatry inpatient department after being detained by the police. He was found running onto the dual carriageway whilst experiencing auditory and visual hallucinations. In his past medical history, he suffers from schizophrenia and has had many similar episodes in the past. He normally takes oral respiridone, but his adherence is known to be poor. In his social history, he has significant cannabis and alcohol use for over 10 years. He stays on the ward for several weeks and sees improvement with adherence to medication. After the ward round, risperidone in the form of a depot injection must be prescribed and the patient needs to be provided with appropriate information about the new treatment. The question proceeds to ask you to select the most appropriate option that should be communicated to the patient. So time again to pause here and consider your answer. Now that you have considered your answer, let's go through the question. 
The question details that with improved adherence to risperidone, a second generation antipsychotic, historically known as an atypical antipsychotic, his condition has improved significantly. Whilst not explicitly stated, it is also reasonable to assume that abstinence from cannabis will have further contributed to an improvement in his condition. This question is asking you to establish what is the most important information to explain to a young adult who has a significant history of schizophrenia and substance misuse about a change in the form his medication is administered. The question informs you that an injectable form of risperidone has been prescribed. This is commonly known as a depot injection. The benefit from administering medication in this form is multifactorial. Firstly, you know that the patient has physically received the medication as a nurse or other healthcare professional must administer it. Secondly, it has a long half-life, ensuring that the dose received is in the therapeutic range for around a month. Lastly, due to its long half-life and consistency of release, patients typically no longer have to remember to take daily oral antipsychotics. Now, let's have a look at the answers. Answer B is the correct answer, as it correctly describes the purpose of a depot injection, and states that once he is effectively settled on the injectable form, he will no longer have to take oral risperidone. Working logically through the incorrect answers, answer A is incorrect, as it states that the depot risperidone has a short half-life. Answer C is also incorrect, as lipodystrophy may occur, and injection sites must always be rotated to avoid this. Answer D is possible, however, it is not the best information to communicate to the patient, as he struggles to take his medication in the community. Withdrawing the depot injection and switching it back to oral medication, which he has to remember to take, is therefore unlikely to be considered. Answer E is incorrect, as whilst having antipsychotic medication in his system will reduce the likelihood of him developing drug-induced psychosis, it does not offer complete protection. As such, continuing to abuse these substances will only worsen his mental health. I hope that this explanation makes sense and will highlight why answer B is the most important information that should be provided to the patient. I hope that you have enjoyed this video as part of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA series. For further study resources, please visit our website. If you have any queries about anything covered in this video, please contact our team via email or Facebook. If you have a minute to spare, we would love it if you could complete the feedback form linked below in the description. We look forward to seeing you in our next video, Section 5, Calculation Skills. Uh -huh.